Hey guys, so I made a video a little while back over, overviewing the techniques that Sargent did, and today I kind of wanted to go into the actual application of the process. So you can see, if you didn't see my other video, I showed a few of these off, but I'm an avid copier of Sargent, or a studier, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, I, I just love, and other artists obviously, like DeLazlo and you know some of the others, but uh, I love doing oil paintings of Sargent stuff, larger drawings, smaller drawings, you know. It's really a very convenient thing when you're sitting in class to just pull up a painting or something and just, just copy it. And it might not even be for learning the design and how they're distributing values and stuff, although you do learn that. It's also just to exercise uh, drawing every single day. If you don't really have a very orchestrated piece in front of you, if you're in a class or something, you don't really want to draw you know, hands or people sitting in front of you, you want to draw something more interesting. I think pulling up a painting online and then just doing a study of it is a really, really effective way of just getting your hours in as far as drawing goes, you know? So if you're really learning to draw, I would highly suggest copying artists. Um, and then you, you can, of course, apply it to your work. So today we're going to be doing a study of this head here. And I'm going to be talking about shape and proportion and some other things that I referred to in my original video about Sargent. I'll definitely link it in the description if you guys missed it. And I'll probably outline some of the techniques that he's using, and then I'll speed up a, lar a large part of this process because it takes a little bit to explain a principle, but it takes a lot longer to actually, you know, put into use. And then there's just going to be a lot of wasted minutes that I don't want you guys want to, you know, to sit through. If you do want a, you know, a longer scale video where I actually do show the entire process in real time, you could just leave a comment down below, and I'd love to do that for you guys. But I'm going to do it a little differently this time. So anyway, let's get started. Uh, so, <clears throat> I don't I I don't remember seeing any accounts about Sargent using site size, but it's an extremely valuable thing to have in your toolbox as an artist. So you might be wondering what is site size. So site size when you're drawing means that the size on your paper and the size of the actual sitter is the same. So what that does is that I'm not taking this and scaling it, or you know, you know, I'm not making it bigger and I'm not making it smaller. And what that does is that it actually helps a lot with getting the correct proportions. Because when you're just working off of shapes and you don't have any relative proportions to work off of, it does make things much more difficult. A lot of the time when I'm making a painting, and you can uh, check out some of my paintings on my Instagram, but a lot of times when I'm making a painting, I have my phone up and I'll work off a reference on my phone. And that is a total pain because it's, it's scaling it up like, you know, <laughs> a thousand percent or whatever it is usually if i'm working on a large scale oil painting and it's just so much easier and streamlined to do it site size so an example of site size would be and you can see from this camera view how you know it would actually look for yourself you take the measurement let's say of the length of the head and then you go over here and then you would just mark the top of it i like getting a measurement twice And then once you take it, you can just double check it. And then also another useful thing, if you're measuring, is if you're measuring, you want, you know, it's usually you're gonna have your easel perpendicular with the floor and you're gonna have your sitter obviously perpendicular to the floor. So you wanna lock out your elbow when you're measuring this way so that when you're actually measuring, you're not going like this. Because if I take this measurement and then I back up and then I go over here, that's, that's the wrong measurement, right? That's not proportional. But if you keep a straight elbow, then you're not really getting as much of a movement that would ruin your scaling, pretty much, your proportions. So there was accounts of Sargent saying that he did get the general, he took some general marks of the sitter. And I'm assuming that those general marks were probably the nose, the brow, and the forehead. And typically on a human face, things are broken up into thirds. And then depending on who you're looking at to get an accurate likeness, those thirds change a little bit. So you can see on uh, certain public figures, if people have a really distinct face, it's usually because they mess up those proportions. Either they have a really, really large, like, you know, from the tip of their nose to the end of their chin, they have a large amount of that, or they have a big forehead or they have a short forehead, you know. But these small, small differences is what makes people look the way that they do. And if you're trying to get a likeness, you the, the most crucial thing you can do is get the proportions correct because the proportions will screw everything. And if your proportions are wrong, then your shapes are wrong and vice versa, you know, shapes are wrong, proportions are wrong. 
So a really useful thing you can do when you're painting is to get those proportions first. So I just measured it while I was talking there. And it looks like it's a, it's pretty much dead on to the thirds, except that his forehead's just a little bit taller. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm just gonna put on some sloppy marks and then we're gonna see where that lines up. So that's pretty close to thirds. Probably move that up here. I never actually pull out a ruler or something. You know, art is not a science, really. It's an art, right? So the more uh, mechanical you make it, the more difficult it's become. So I'm just gonna erase that right there. And then we'll double check. That's a little bit off. Okay, so now that I've gotten my thirds in, one, two, and three. I know that the brow ridge is gonna line up here. I know at the end of the nose is gonna line up there. And the chin is gonna line up there. So the next thing you wanna do is that now you've gotten the, the length of the face, you wanna get the width of the face as well. And this isn't always the way I work. Like if I'm doing a really small study, like I'm scaling like I was saying, then I generally just use shapes. And shapes is a really powerful tool, but if you wanna get it very precise, you should grab your proportions before you start knocking in your shapes. So like for, example this stuff like I, I wasn't measuring really at all you know i was i was just drawing shapes but if you want it to be accurate you should do it this way and then the also the other advantage of knocking out these proportions is that you don't really have to do that detailed of an underdrawing because the more detailed you make your underdrawing when you're painting you're just going to cover up your whole underdrawing and if you have this really detailed like perfect underdrawing you're gonna be extremely cautious of really covering that painting with a lot of confident paint. And when you do that, your painting's gonna feel very tight and recluse. And once you have that, it's gonna look less aesthetically appealing. So this is another positive, just getting the you know a few marks down. And then if I was gonna paint this, then I wouldn't really go any further than um, getting the general proportions. So the next thing we're gonna do is get the width of the face. And I'm just going to like generally mark that out. And then you can test if that's correct. Don't look generally correct. And then another useful thing is getting just the general shape of the head. So now that I have these like very general guidelines down, I can just kind of think of the head as like a general egg. All right, so I changed up the lighting a bit because the direct light from the sun was casting some shadows. Anyway, let's get back into it. So <clears throat> another thing you want to think about is the general shape of the actual head. So if I'm looking at this shape, it's good that we knocked in the proportions and stuff, but now we're going to start getting into the actual shapes, right? So the head here is really ovular, you know? So for some people, they have a more triangular face. Some people, they have a more square face. It really depends. For this guy, he has a very circular sort of jaw. So I'm just gonna get a very general idea of what that might look like. I can see up here, you can see that this is really angled like that. And then I'm just gonna check that over here. See how that just doesn't really line up. So I'm gonna move that up a little bit. Still regarding this original proportion that I put up here, right? We can grab the angle from that top of the head right there. And a lot of the time what I do is that I'll grab an angle and then I'll look at the top of that. So let's say we're grabbing the angle right here, right? So I can see the negative shape that that creates is not the same as this. So you can see that negative shape is a little more thick. So I'm just gonna add on a little bit more meat to that. And that's like a good general kind of starting point for that left side. And then for this right side, we already grabbed the proportion for it. Let's see, make sure this is correct. And if you actually have a live sitter in front of you and you're not just copying or you know <laughs> using reference like this, then you can still do the same thing with working from life. You know, you can hold your pencil up to the sitter, grab a proportion like that. Right, And then if you correct proportions and then you build the shape on top of that, makes it a lot more streamlined and easy. 
working purely off shape does work, especially if you've done it for a while, but it is really difficult to get them correct every single time. So anyway, this, this uh, right side is really, really straight. If we put up an angle to this, you can see like very, very straight as far as how it goes up. So if we check that proportion right here, we meet over there. Super straight like that. And then we're just gonna bring that down. And then next, if you look at the shape that this creates, it's kind of like kind of like an apple slice, you know. Sometimes it's easy to think about shapes as like real things. And then another thing I like to do is grab angles to my landmarks. So my land, you hear that term landmark thrown around, right? This is what a landmark basically is. Just a little suggestion about where to place things. So I know that this is correct. I know that this is in the place that it should be, right? I know that this nose is in the place. You know, I, I, had, I have evidence for that because I already took the proportions. So now that I know that it's correct, what I can do is that I can grab angles based off of that correct placement. So you can see where this light shape curls up into the dark shape. It makes a little point right here. So I that's that's a little place that I want to know where that's going to be on this drawing. I don't know exactly where it's going to be. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take a measurement or I'm going to take an angle rather. So go like that. And then if we go over here, then we know it's going to be somewhere along that angle, right? So I just suggested a little bit, check the angle again. Always check things constantly because it's really easy to screw up a measurement. And if we squint and look at this shape that this nose kind of creates, kind of goes there. Something like that. That's the general kind of shape. You don't really want to get the shape, you don't necessarily have to make it perfect on the first try. If this is a really large curve, let's say on the side of his face, that's pretty curvature, or uh, that's pretty curvy, right? So to actually get that, I wanna get the general essence of it first, and then I can start adding in the more intricate elements. So if I'm looking at this edge of the face, I might just say, well, that's pretty close to straight, so I'm gonna put it down straight. And then later when I'm just rendering things in a more higher regard, I'm gonna say, okay, well, there's a little more nuance to that than a straight. There's a little indentation, right? And if I do that, then I can get the big picture right, and then I can get all the subtleties right at the same time. But if I'm focusing too much on the details to begin with, things go south very quickly. So I'm looking about where this face kind of lines up, and I'll notice that the half point of the nose right here cuts halfway in between this chin, right? So if I have this chin right here, I know like generally that's where the halfway part of the face is going to go. So I'm just going to put a little center line there. And then another thing is in the human face, and this is really helpful if you're going to draw imaginatively, you want to know the proportions of the human face, right? So I already talked about the thirds, but the, the eyes are almost always right in the middle. Yeah, see? Almost always right in the middle of the face. Now with this one, look at this. It's dead on right in the middle you know now some people's aren't really exactly in the middle and you want to take note of that but generally speaking the eyes are always in the middle of the head and then you can see the nose has this angle so i'm just going to copy that so another thing uh you can look into is rhythms so this goes past just copying it this is kind of designing the model in eyebrows a lot of the time you want them to follow kind of a curve so if you take your pencil make a curve like that. It feels very flowy and continuous, especially if you're using your arm to draw. And with eyebrows, you wanna do a similar thing. When things line up in your composition through curves, it makes the whole thing feel like it's molding and moving and all this other stuff. But if they're a little bit out of line, not only is it usually an incorrect drawing mistake, at least you know anatomically for the eyebrows, but it, it breaks the flow of the image. Your eye likes a lot of flow. So what we're gonna do here is that we're just gonna get a general idea of the flow of those eyebrows, just with one curve, and then you can just separate them like that. But this way it lines up and it just feels a little more 
like a flow. Now, Sargent said that he always drew what he saw exactly, but he didn't really. He was he was designing the model in some very subtle ways. He was kind of if you had a dial system for drawing, he was doing accuracy, let's say to like ninety nine percent, like one percent of it. He was changing just very subtly to make it look a little bit better. He might have made the the mustache twirlier. Might have made the eyebrows a little more, you know, add a little bit more mood to it. Something like that. You know, if you copy exactly what you see, first of all, that's impossible. You know, you'd have to be a robot. Um, but if you're doing pretty much too exact, it's going to not feel as lively as if you start designing the shapes and stuff. And I also have some videos on my channel about how to design shapes. And there's lots of great channels that go over that. And that's kind of, you're going to meet a point in your study of art where you're done with copying. You know, you're done with just making the reference on the photo and you want to do something else and you want to be a little more creative and once you're at that point you can really start getting into designing shapes and lines and all this other stuff so there's a lot of information that i put here that's wrong so i'm going to get rid of that so it doesn't confuse me another good thing about mapping out curves is that you can do use straights to map up a curve. So let's say this curve that I made down here, when I was talking about rhythm, let's say I wanted to draw this curve. This is the reference I want to draw this. If I was gonna draw this, I'd copy it down to my paper, something like that. Now it's it's not exactly what it is, right? Oh, can you, <laughs> there we go. So it's not exactly what this is, but after I create this, I can put my pencil up here and I can see that angle and then I can copy the negative shape in there you know it goes something like that and this one goes in a little bit you know what I mean and then I can see even further you know copying it like that so that's kind of one method of doing it and you can see those are pretty accurately similar another method of doing it is just doing it really light and then just continually doing it until you get it right? You can get a feel for which one you like more. There's obviously other methods than that, but those are kind of two things that I think about. So I'm going to grab the angle, just like I was talking, or that mustache lightly. And I find this kind of stuff really therapeutic. It's, it's really fun to just copy shapes. I'm not really sure why, but when there's something so satisfactory, uh, satisfactory about when you've done something accurately like that, you know? It's just a lot of fun for me. If you, if originally when you start drawing, drawing is not gonna be fun. And a lot of people think that you have to enjoy every single aspect of what you're passionate about. And I don't think that's really true to be honest. I think there's a lot of things, like I think nobody goes into science, let's say, to learn about the intricacies of the biological processes of the human body. Some people might, right? But most people find that stuff kind of boring. You don't really care about what which labeled chemical is doing X, Y, and Z. You care generally more about the bigger stuff that you can do with that. You know? So you kind of get through all the crap to get to the gold at the end of the rainbow. And with art, it's kind of the same thing. Nobody really wants to do another anatomy study. Nobody wants to do a value, like you work on their values or whatever. They care about making really beautiful art. But once you get to a point where you're more proficient at the stuff that takes a long time and mileage to get through, once you start doing that, you can start finding a lot more enjoyment out of it because it's more reflexive. You know, it's not really as laborious and obnoxious to get through. Another thing too that people mess up when they're drawing, when they're new, at least, you know, you can still screw it up if you're proficient at it. When you're when you're drawing faces especially, the way that the light hits the object is in a very straight kind of way. Like a lot of things line up. So if you're drawing this, you can see that it gets a little bit darker right on this edge. So if I was grabbing the angle here, I know that these are probably gonna line up really, really close. But if you're, if you're new to drawing, you might put this edge up a little bit and this edge down a little bit. And there's that disjoint. So you're always gonna wanna look for where things are lining up across the face. And that's going to make it shading or rendering really a whole lot easier. All right, so right here, I'm going to see if everything lines up. 
And if it does, that means my proportions are generally correct. Let's see, that nose needs to move down a little bit. And another thing too is that if you get all the proportions right, first try, let's say, we get, you get them perfect. Hell, you even you trace it or something. Like you know it's perfect. If you start painting it, or even rendering it really in drawing, but your uh, painting is a lot more dramatic for this effect. If you're painting it, drawing it, whatever, then what happens is that you cover up the painting, and then if you don't know how to draw very well, and you just copied it, like traced it or whatever, then what happens is that you're screwed because <laughs> you're you cover it up and you still don't have the drawing skills to really manipulate stuff. So I grabbed this original proportion. I knew that was correct. But somewhere along the line, I was manipulating this and I moved it down a bit. If I didn't know how to draw and I didn't know how to use angles, I didn't know how to use proportions and stuff, it would really be bad, right? Unless I have some sort of projector or something and I project it on the painting, then there's no way I can go back and you know change it. And if you're in a drawing, you're in a life scenario, then that's definitely not gonna work. You're not going to be able to grid up a person in real life, you know, unless you have one of those like translucent grids. But at that point, I mean, you should really just learn how to draw, you know, and that's that's one of the reasons why I don't think I think tracing is fine, but it does limit you as an artist. You know, I don't think anybody would deny that drawing is a very useful skill to have. And the other problem I have with tracing, too, is that it doesn't really learn. It doesn't teach you how to design. If you're creating a shape and it's so easy to just trace the shape right onto your paper, you're not thinking about how to actually manipulate it on your own drawing or whatever, your reference, to make it look a little bit more appealing. If I'm if this beard was um, in, in front of me right now, like the actual guy, there were there's probably a lot of intricacies and different stuff that Sargent omitted on purpose. And the only way that he learned how to do that was by not just directly copying the reference. It was by getting the essence of something. Like there's no way that this beard had this elegant of a swoop, where it's just gesturally going down like that and that's something you just learn by drawing and you'll see that when people trace their drawings become really stiff and one of the reasons for that is that they're not really building it up through different layers because if you build it up from gesture and then you add form and then you add shapes or whatever then you go through all the steps and you keep that flow of the original sketch but if you just trace it straight up and you, you miss all those original constructive steps then what happens is that the drawing is going to look a little more stiff now you can trace all you, you can trace, you know, it's still, I think if art still communicates an emotion, it's still art, but that's not to say that they're an artist is equally skilled if they don't, if they do trace versus if they don't, right? If an artist doesn't trace and they create something, it's gonna be a lot more impressive for me. And they're going to be a lot more versatile of an artist than somebody who traces all the time. So now is kind of the point in the drawing where the underdrawing and all the proportions and these lines and stuff, are feeling like very uh, chaotic. So I look at this and it feels very confusing. Like, I don't know which line is doing what. It doesn't really look like the person yet. And the reason for that is I haven't put it in my giant tonal masses yet. And this is the point where if you keep working on the underdrawing, then you're not gonna catch a lot of proportional mistakes. So as soon as I really put in all these value masses, I noticed that I did a lot of things wrong. But it's a lot harder to see that when you haven't actually filled all of those in. So if you're using a lead holder, I really suggest getting a lead holder for this kind of, this specifically, laying in large value masses. But if not, you can really uh, just grab a pencil and you can and you can carve it out in X-Acto blade and you can sharpen it so you can get the lead long like this. And the reason why artists like to have their lead that's long is so that they can shade large area masses at once. So if I grab this, I can really shade pretty fast. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put this in generally lightly so that I can make changes. But this will give enough suggestion of a shadow without making it so dark that I can't ever erase it. Now, another problem you'll uh, run into if you're copying curves with straight lines is that you'll get a very angular kind of drawing. And I did this a lot. But I used to use a lot of angles. And angles are great, and they're really good at getting accurate proportions and stuff. But your drawings will feel a little... Here's one. Here's one from a while back. It looks, like, pretty bright, but the eyes are very, like, sharp. And you see how everything's not very flowy. It doesn't look like there's a lot of curves. Here's another good example. 
Like, it's just very angular. And if you want that look, you know, that's great. But um, one of the things Sergeant did well was that he was always finding curves in the face, you know, like in this mustache or whatever. And if you make it too angular, then it starts to look too linear. And a good, good way of doing it is just like I was explaining earlier with getting the straights. You want to just kind of go over, over it with a gestural line, you know, like, like that. Now, another thing that's good for drawing those large value masses is just squinting. So this area, let's say in the lips, looks brighter than the surroundings. But if you squint your eyes, you're really going to start to see that it's just the whole area is very dark. There is nuance there. But if we're working general to specific, like I was explaining in my other video, then you're going to get a much more accurate drawing, tonally and uh, drawing-wise. So if I look at this and I squint my eyes, this entire area looks pretty dark. So I'm going to get the average light right here and just knock that whole thing in. And once I do that, if I do that everywhere, then it's going to start looking more and more like a face. Even for the eyes here, and Sergeant, if you look at um, old paintings or paintings that are unfinished from Sergeant, you'll see a lot of the time that he draws, uh, he paints eyes like this. Like it's just a little one brushstroke and it's kind of just the suggestion of an eye and then he'll go back into it later. And the reason that he did that is because he knew that the skull was really what was important for the likeness. It wasn't necessarily the very shape of the eye or the, the eyelashes or whatever. It was getting the general, you know, features correct, generally placed and then just being very general but accurate at the same time. And another thing Sergeant's kind of doing here with this face, and once you get good at likenesses, actually just making it look like a person, you can start playing around with this kind of stuff. But he uses a combination within the face of straights and curves. So you can see here, this eyebrow is really, really straight, like pretty much as straight as my pencil. And then it goes into this curve of an eyebrow. So there's this dance here of difference. And when you add difference into your artwork, it starts looking a lot more aesthetic. So you can also see here, he made this really, really straight. You know, this side of the face is really, really straight. But it's always kind of complemented with a curve. And if you're doing shape design, let's say we just make a sh uh, shape. Then if when you have those curves and straights next to each other, they kind of sing along together. And it looks like a much more interesting shape than if it's, it was uh, very symmetrical, you know? If I add in two curves, like that, then it just looks a little bit worse, right? All right, so now I see that this eye needs to move down a bit. And if, if there's one problem in your drawing, then it usually means that other stuff is wrong. So if this eye needs to move down, that also means that this eyebrow is inaccurate immediately, right? So I know that if the eye is wrong, the eyebrow is wrong, so let's check. Yeah, it needs to move down a bit. You can see that even though this cheek is in light, and you'll see this in a lot of three-quarter lighting, even though this is in light and it feels bright compared to the rest, it's still really, really dark. That is not white at all. You know, so if you squint your eyes, you're really going to see that much more literally. You'll see this entire dark shape across the face. And this is really the, the secret, quote unquote, to a likeness. It's not focusing on the details. It's focusing on these really large value masses. And actually, how you make compositions work is also by focusing on the value masses. I'll talk about that in another video. But the big picture is just so crucial in art, and it's so often neglected and to people's peril. Now, another thing Sergeant said was that value mistakes in drawing aren't really as deathly to your end result as it is in painting. You can mess up some of the values. And although Sergeant is the king of values, a lot of the time in the hair, because it's a drawing, he'll have a little bit of fun with it. You'll see, like, in larger scale, let me pull one out here. Okay, like this. So obviously it's not going to be that bright in the hair, especially if it's this really dark um, uh, dark brown hair. It's not going to be that light. But because it's a drawing, you kind of you kind of just forgive it. It's very weird. If you had done this with a painting, it wouldn't have worked quite as well. So that's an interesting distinction between painting and drawing. Although a lot of people say painting and drawing are exactly the same. Obviously there's going to be some differences, right? It's more useful to think about them as the same. 
really. Like uh, Morgan Weisling always talks about that. Jeff Watts always talks about that. They are essentially the same, but there are some differences in different mediums, and that is one of them. Now, what I was just doing there is that if I'm looking at this indentation where the head indents, we were talking about earlier about this was pretty much straight, and now I'm going to render it a little bit more specifically. So you see this little indentation, and it might be more subtle on camera, but you'll see that from the hair to the edge of the head right here, it indents a little bit. Now, plotting where that goes in this direction, you know, in the uh, vertical direction, right? Plotting where that point goes, where they meet, I can grab an angle. So I know it's coming right off of the eyebrow here. So if we come right off the eyebrow there, right, right, that's where they meet. And then I'm gonna draw those angles. And then I'm gonna draw the curve a little bit more gesturally. Working a little bit more. So now what I'm doing is that once I've gotten in these large value shapes, all the darks is the same value, I'm gonna start adding in a little bit more of the subtleties. So you can see here on the edge of the nose, it's really, really dark right here, right? And right here, it's less dark, right? So I got in the average tone, and now I'm gonna work into moving those darker tones and pushing those, right? And to do that, I'm gonna get the correct value shape. So we can see that this shape angles up this way, and then it looks kind of like, it's hard, I'm moving around this camera here. And another thing I've found in drawing and painting as well, the cleaner your value shapes are, the better it looks. So if I put in this really clean shape and I don't add in really darks in here and really lights in here and all this other stuff, if I make it really clean shape, it gives the drawing, uh, it's a very indescribable feeling, but it looks a little bit better, at least in my opinion. I like really, really clean shapes. If you take this beard, for example, it's a light shape. If you grab this eye socket shape right there, it's just this really clean shape. There's not a lot of detail in there. You're not messing up, you know, mucking about with it. And if you do that, it gives it a very, very interesting look. I really, I really enjoy it. You know, it's up to everybody's taste, but personally, I really like it. Now, another thing Sergeant did a lot was that in his dark areas, he bleeded in a lot of the edges. So if you're not familiar and you're entirely new to art, edges is the transition between two value shapes, pretty much. So if we have, let's say two squares right here, and one of them is that dark and the other one is that light, it's a very hard edge, right? And if I wanna make this edge a little bit softer, there's a few things you can do. One, you can smudge it. Never do that. <laughs> Don't use, I really hate drawing stumps. I think they're awful. I would never use them because it completely screws the values of the piece. If I wanted to soften an edge right here and I started pulling in lights from this area and darks from this area, especially if you're painting that happens, then all the values start getting screwed up and it just ruins your painting. If you wanna soften an edge drawing wise, you just softly add like a little bit of a mid-tone there. And what happens is that you can still see the general shape that it was, but it feels softer, right? It feels like the edges are kind of bleeding into the other one. Now, if you wanna make a really hard edge, you draw it in, and then you'd grab an eraser and really harden it up. Now, the way that you use your edges is a very, it's a very large topic. I might make a video on it someday. But generally speaking, and it's a very, very general rule, this isn't 100% how you should always use it, but in the subject, you should use the hard edges and then in the peripheral elements, you use the softer edges. And Sargent did this a ton. So if you, the subject is the face, then for the supplemental you know, elements, like suggestions of the clothing, you know, maybe a tie right here and you know, his coat jacket or whatever, you're gonna make the edges very soft. So right here, you can see it just trails off. And it's really hard to see where this ends and the paper actually begins. And you can see that he's using a lot harder edges, like right in this eye here that's a super hard edge compared to that, right? And he's not using a ton of soft edges in the face. He is in some of the mid-tones because when light actually curves over the form, it does soften a lot. But when he's having this hard transition of form and it's in the subject, he makes the edges a lot harder. Now, 
Now what this is, and if you've been through art, you know what this is, but just for the people getting started, I'm gonna explain it. This is called a core shadow right here. So right when the light transitions from light to dark, there's this period where it gets darker and then it gets lighter. And what's actually happening there is that constantly throughout the day on any object that has light on it, it's bouncing the light because lights are just light rays, right? And what happens is that if the light is bouncing, it's going all over the place. It's not really as direct as we think it is because it's going on this surface and then it's, you know, going off of it. And there's, there's all these objects interacting around the room. And what bounce light is, is when you have an object, this is too dark. <laughs> uh, when you have an object, right, and you have a light bouncing from one object to another in the dark, in the shadow, what happens is you can kind of see it actually in here is that it bounces from the page into the object. So you can see that it gets lighter and then it gets darker. And what's happening is that the bounce light is lightening that shadow up a bit, and then it creates this line that's darker because that's not getting the bounce light from the paper. So hopefully that makes sense, but you can see that on faces, it's obviously, the light, light works on everything the same, right? And on faces, it's no different. Now it's really, it's quite more subtle for this face because the, the lighting is so much more harsh, but it is less dark right here than it is right on the edge. Now, the thing you'll find with likenesses, and this will make likenesses so difficult, is that they are down to the, like, millimeter. They are so, you have to be so precise with it. Even just there, when I move that eyebrow down, that would have made it a little, off, a little bit off. And if you have, like, five, screw that, three mistakes on the thing that are millimeter off, you get the likeness off. You, it's so, so precise when you're drawing. And that's why getting a likeness just takes so much repetition and you have to be extremely, extremely accurate at drawing. And that's why, why Sargent was so revered by everybody because to get a likeness, you know, getting likeness is one thing, right? But to get it in like 10 brush strokes or make it look like you got it in 10 brush strokes, that's a whole nother thing. And that's what he was so good at. You know, if you look at his paintings, if you look up Sargent's faces up close, you'll see just how loose that was. And the way that he was doing it is that he was thinking about these large value masses. And then he would he uh, talked about rendering the form. And then after he was could be done, and it looked more complex than it needed to be, he would simplify it. So just like how I was talking about earlier, how you want simple value shapes that don't have a lot of detail within them. They're just they're just you know straight up shapes that are filled in and they don't have dark area spots and light spots and stuff. You want to go back when you do have those complexities and you want to get rid of them. So if I did have a lot of lights and dark spots in this one shape, for example, then I would just fill it in and make it one stroke or whatever. And then if you do that, it makes it look a lot better. And I mean, technically, from the technical standpoint, it looks much more impressive when you do that. So another thing you want to do to get accurate drawings is that you want to get multiple points of reference. And what I mean by that is that if you're, let's say I'm trying to get where this point is in the drawing. So right where the ear overlaps and it goes into the hair right there, I really want to see where this bump is. And to get that bump down precisely, I want to find multiple different things in the drawing to reference towards to make sure that it's correct. So what I mean by that, if you go like this, I can see that from the edge of the eyebrow to this bump, it creates this angle. So if we bring that over here, okay, it's correct. But I don't know for sure if that's correct or not. I might have screwed up this eyebrow, right? And if I screw up this eyebrow, then it might be correct, but it's not really correct. So I want to take another measurement. Let's say from this tip of the eyebrow, I'll take a measurement there. So it pretty much lines up, not quite precisely, but it's like, you know, it's pretty close. So we have the second measurement there confirming that it's generally in the right place. Third one, I'm gonna get from right where this eyebrow edge is over, correct. And then, you know, and so on. If you, you, can, you can get 10 or 20 or however you want, but you generally don't wanna just go based on one piece of evidence that you, placed it correctly because otherwise what happens is that if I make this eye wrong and then I base my ear off of the mistake that I did in the eye then my ear is wrong and then let's say I base my mustache angle on the ear 
and then so on, so on, so on. And what happens is that the entire drawing gets screwed because of that. Now, another thing the sergeant did, and this is past learning how to just draw basically, is suggestion. Suggestion is really, really interesting. And if you use it correctly, it's always the mark of a more advanced artist. So what is suggestion? Suggestion is showing what's there, but it's not precisely dictating it exactly. It's just kind of indicating it just slightly, right? So if we have this collar right here, then we know the edge of the shirt goes on like this. And we also know that this isn't, this should be darker in value, right? It shouldn't be white unless he's wearing it. It wouldn't even, if he even had a white suit on, it wouldn't be bright white, right? But what Sergeant did here is that he just left it up to the imagination. He just put it down these lines and then he suggested it. And that's enough for the subconscious pretty much. And you know, he's actually doing the same sort of thing within the face. So the way that the nose anatomy works, there would actually be a shadow here, but he's not doing it so precisely. He's just kind of suggesting it, right? And that's really all you sort of need, especially if you take back a far, you step back, it looks totally correct. Even the shirt looks correct, even though it's wrong, you know, you could say. Now, I was talking about edges earlier. A good way to get a sharp edge is to hold your pencil like this, like, you know, the normal way everybody wants to draw. Shouldn't really be generally drawing like that. Um, but the way to get soft edge is to hold your pencil like this. So this, if I can get the camera to go, gives much more of an airbrushy kind of quality, whereas this is obviously sharper. So to get this nose down accurately, and when I talk about just basic face shapes, this is just a pentagon, just a five-sided kind of pentagon, right? And if you get all the angles right there, then it's gonna look correct on the nose. Now, in fact, I kinda <laughs> clean that up a little bit, but I am essentially just copying all these small shapes into a little jigsaw puzzle based off of that proportions, those proportions that I got originally. And if I do that, getting a likeness is gonna be easier as well. Now, the other thing Sergeant did is that he would put in a stroke and then he'd just leave it. He wouldn't muddle up with it. He wouldn't fix it and all this other crap. He would just, you know, and then it'd be perfect and be done. Now, for us mortals, mortal humans, you know, who aren't God himself, we have to erase sometimes and fix it, right? But if you make it look like, at least, that you did it on the first try, stuff's going to look a lot more confident and it's going to look more aesthetically appealing. Now you can really see this, I was talking about shape design with uh, Frazetta and Sargent in some of my other videos, and you can see it in action right here. Sargent is thinking about this as a designed sort of shape. He's not mimicking this exactly. His hair, obviously not a line here, and his hair was not that geometrical, where it has this like perfect curve, right? There was, there's these frizzies, and I bet there was uh, loose hair probably somewhere in there. He was just getting kind of the, the gestural essence. And when you have these very geometrical sort of shapes, on the peripheral elements of the drawing, and you contrast them with the more organic rendered shapes, it again sings with this kind of dance of difference. And the more difference you can add in your drawing, the better. Well, my pencil just broke <laughs> inside of this thing, so I'm gonna shorten a little bit. That is the worst sound to hear. That's like 50 cents just down the drain. Anyway, so I was putting in some lines there before I broke my pencil. And lines are an interesting concept. So in painting, you can add lines. You'll see lines in a lot of older art, especially. You'll see in even in Michelangelo, the creation of Adam, the, the piece in the Sistine Chapel where God and Adam are about to touch fingers like that, right? You'll see that across Adam's figure and even, you know, everything else in the composition, there's these lines, right? And a line is just, or outlines really is what it is. So on the outside of the form, and you'll see that Sargent does that sometimes too. Now, Sargent doesn't do it in his paintings, but he does do it in his drawings. And interesting thing about lines is that the way that we learn to, to see is, is the way that we learn to touch. And you'll see that in the book, the, I believe it's called The Science of Drawing, something like that. And in that book, they talk about how when we're kids, we learn to see with our hands a lot. So we'll touch the edges of objects and we'll see if the edge is sharp or soft. And when we're drawing, originally, 
and we don't really have a very sophisticated idea of what we're doing, we always want to put lines everywhere. We're outlining everything, right? When we're drawing a house, it's just outlines. You know, it's a little triangle and you need a square or whatever. It's all outlines. And that's because we know that the edge of houses is sharp or whatever. Now, when you're more mature and you start copying value masses and you understand that the world around us isn't all literal lines, right? Then you start getting more rendered and accurate drawings. Now you can add in lines and it looks very, very interesting. And if you do add in lines in a very sophisticated way, then it looks pretty aesthetic, but you kind of have to know what you're doing. So a lot of the time you can add lines on the outside of objects. And then as soon as they curl into the object, the form would curl into the object, you lose the line's thickness, the weight of the line. So you can see that he's really thick on the outside. And then as soon as he gets into this collar, collar he lowers the line weight. So that's just one example of how you can use lines in your drawings. Now, another thing Sergeant did was that the skin, even in the lightest spot, is not going to be super, super bright unless it's an actual highlight. So, like right there on the forehead, for example, or somewhere on the nose, usually there's a little highlight right on the bridge of the bone. But <clears throat> when it's not bright, bright white, if you want to get an accurate value and you're working in graphite or charcoal, to get that more subtle one step from down light value, you can just grab some lines and kind of cross hatch it a little bit and you can see that you can visibly see that right here and if you make out the lines pretty soft then it's not very noticeable but it still looks pretty cool so you know you just go in with one of these now another thing you also want to keep in mind is that the white of the eye is never white it's never pure white the highlight on the eye might be close to pure white, but in the eye there, it's not going to be. So when you're generally knocking in an eye, you want to just lay in, you know, a pretty dark value mass, like decently dark, right? Darker than you'd think for white. And then once you do that, just don't remove it because if you have bright white in the eyes, it's going to look visually wrong. All right, you guys, I'm probably going to call that good here. I am not going to say that this is a perfect likeness or anything, but I do think it's decently close. And a lot of these principles that I was using in discussing this video is what Sargent was using when he was creating these charcoal portraits and his paintings. Didn't really matter what he was using. Value masses, shapes, you know, angles, proportions, etc. So... <clears throat> I really hope you guys had a fun time. I hope you learned something. All the best, and uh, go make something beautiful. See you guys later.